can, uh, tell a couple of stories about getting people to talk about what went on in the Trump White House for the first several years. And uh, it was, um, I think, in early 2018. So it, the book came out in September. Uh, I was working, talking to people, and there was a key person in the White House. And uh, I had his home phone number. And uh, so I called him at 8 o'clock, no answer, 9 o'clock, no answer, 10 o'clock, no answer. And the question was, should I try at 11 o'clock? Now, how many people would call somebody at home at 11 o'clock at night? Raise your hands. How many would not? OK. I want to hire the one guy who said he would. <laughs> Because uh, I did call with some hesitation at 11 o'clock, and this official answered and said, I'd like to talk to you about the Trump White House and what's going on. And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, you, you know, call the office tomorrow, standard push off. And I said, well, uh, I'm four minutes from your house. What, uh, could I come by now? And he said, four minutes from my house. How do you know where I live? And I said, that's easy. And uh, he said, remarkably said, okay, come on by for a few minutes. Now, luck is essential to reporting. I think it's essential to anything. Uh, Got there at 11.04 or 11.05, and the luck was his wife was out of town, so he was there alone. And I'd done some work, and this was one of the people in the White House who was just bursting, wanting to talk. And so I started asking questions, and it was not quite, but almost dawn when I left. So four hours of maybe even more of interview. We were able to build a relationship of trust. I was able to come back, get documents. Uh, I remember at, at one point I was asking, do you have any documents or a diary? And he said, no, which is what everyone will say. And of course, everyone who works in the White House, takes something home. And uh, at one point in one of our later interviews at his house, I said, "Is the, I'm trying to establish a date of a certain decision that President Trump made. Do you have anything, a diary, something in writing? He said, well, let me go upstairs and check. And he came down literally carrying boxes of documents that he was willing to share with me. I cite that as an example of people won't call you as a reporter normally, but you have to go to them and you have to, there, there's something I think quite natural, people find comfort in their own home and if you can get to the home, you have a chance. And because there was so much that was questionable going on in the White House, this is a person who it, it was all building up and just kind of let forth and not only answered my questions, but introduced new topics. I would argue that this is a method that could be used in any serious reporting effort when you have time. And uh, the key is I've knocked on doors, not enough, and sometimes you get rejected, and it's very demoralizing. It is. Uh, I'm now 76 years old. You imagine an old man knocking on somebody's door and having them open it and slam 
the door or just say, no, I'm not going to talk. But you have to, and, and, and there's, there's something about showing up that is critical. I, I think it also carries a subliminal message that's not articulated. And that message is, I'm at your doorstep asking you about this because your role in information is significant to my effort to find the truth. And what you're really trying to do and what you are doing is sending the message to somebody, I take you as seriously as you take yourself. There is no one in government at all levels, really, in Washington who does not take themselves seriously. By showing up, you're saying, you're important. I want to listen. You have to be patient. You can't kind of go and talk to somebody for an hour and say, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to leave. I've got another appointment. You want to be able to, like in the, the case of this person, getting into his home was essential. I couldn't, it, it, I hadn't planned that night to stay up until four in the morning, but I have to be in a position where I'm willing to do that once somebody uh, is assisting. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Woodward, I must ask this first. How long do you expect Pre President Trump to remain in the White House? How do you evaluate the possibility of the actual impeachment? Okay, how long do I expect him to remain president in the White House? Yes. See, this is one, um, it's a good question, it's a fair question. I have no effing idea. No. And anybody who tells you that they do is just kind of mouthing off. Journalism is not about the future. And I think this is one of the diseases in the business of trying to predict. And it, it's kind of interesting, particularly if somebody knows something or is pretending they know something. Journalism is about the past, what already happened mm -hmm. that's hidden. So I have no idea. Uh, Trump now, the this week has been monumental in Washington. They've launched formally an impeachment investigation, which means uh, he almost certainly will be charged by the Democratic majority mm -hmm. in the House of Representatives then under the Constitution. If that happens, there is a trial in the Senate, which is now controlled by the Republicans. And so it's, it, you, you can't tell what will happen. What's critical, and this I think is often lost in the discussion, it's about the quality of evidence. We now have, came out uh, today, the uh, account of a conversation, and it looks like almost a transcript between President Trump and the president of Ukraine, in which Trump was trying to enlist Ukraine in the effort to investigate Joe Biden, who was mm -hmm. running for president uh, against Trump. So that that's a, a significant development, but you need lots of evidence. And if, if I, I won't linger on this too long, but if you go back and look at Watergate, which eventually drove Nixon from the White House, there were five wars that Nixon conducted that really define what Watergate is. And before there was a burglary in the Democratic headquarters in 1972, Two years before, Nixon launched his first war, which was against the radical anti-war movement, the movement in the United States uh, which opposed the Vietnam War. And Nixon authorized wiretapping, breaking and entering into the homes of people. The second war that Nixon launched 
was against the news media. And uh, he and his administration conducted wiretaps on 17 reporters and White House aides to track down leaks. Now, Trump calls the news media fake and the enemy of the people. We don't know whether they've wiretapped, whether they've uh, tried to intimidate reporters. Certainly, we know he attacks reporters all the time and uh, is critical. And let's be honest, he's been somewhat successful in arguing that the press should not be trusted. I believe the press, by and large, my newspaper, the Washington Post, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the business newspaper, have done excellent work in covering Trump and uh, have been very aggressive about it. Sometimes it gets a little too emotional, and I think you need to bleach out your emotions when you're covering something like that. So Nixon's war on the anti-war movement, second war against the news media. He also, not just 17 wiretaps, hired a team in the White House to track down leaks, and they broke into the psychiatrist's office of Daniel Ellsberg, the person who leaked the Pentagon Papers. A very aggressive two phases of the Nixon war. The third phase was the war against the Democrats, the people who would run against uh, Nixon. Massive campaign of sabotage and espionage directed at the Democratic candidate. This included the burglary into the Democratic uh, headquarters at the Watergate. The fourth war was a war against the system of justice, which was the cover-up uh, designed to conceal and lie. And this is ultimately where se secret tape recordings showed that Nixon was willing to pay blackmail money to make sure that people did not talk. And the fifth Nixon war after he resigned was a 20-year war, the war against history to try to say, oh no, all of this evidence that you've seen is not really significant or to be believed. And uh, ultimately, because of the tapes and all the investigation, Nixon lost that war. He is going to be remembered in history as a criminal president uh, like no, none other. Now, where does Trump fit into this? There are things Trump's done. I have in my book, Fear, as you translated. Uh, Trump, as I talked about yesterday, is a threat to the national security, where you have the Secretary of Defense, probably one of the most admired men in America, having to tell President Trump that we have these alliances, like the military alliance with South Korea. We have uh, these relationships, they are central to our defense and our security. And Trump, at one meet, top secret meeting, it just goes on a rant about saying, oh no, we're suckers, we're spending all this money, why are we doing this? We'd be so rich if we weren't so dumb. And the Secretary of Defense says to President Trump, we're doing all of these things to prevent World War III. When I first heard that, I was really shocked. The, uh, Trump, in the presidency for one month, uh, I'm sorry, one full year, and the Secretary of Defense has to tell him we're doing all of this to prevent World War III uh, is chilling, frightening, uh, and there are so many other examples uh, in the book uh, of this uh, disregard for the interests of the country and uh, it's it, it and not understanding i don't want to go down a long trail but the 
tariffs on steel, the uh, very large tariffs on Chinese goods make no sense. They don't help the country. Trump's got some idea that we're losing money if we have a trade deficit with some country. Makes absolutely no sense. Thank you. Uh, you've said enough uh, f for us to decide how long Trump will remain in, in the White House. So my second question But he is, may, he, you know, this uh, business of the discussion with the president of Ukraine is very serious and the Democrats are mobilized and Trump may not last long or he may last mm -hmm. out the term and he may be reelected okay. because there are people who support him who think uh, that uh, his, I mean, he, he went in to disrupt things. And one of the big mistakes the media makes, I believe, is they say, oh, Trump, is, he's, he's not normal. He's uh, evading the norms of what presidents have done in the past. Trump was elected to not be normal. And we shouldn't be surprised that he does these things. The question is, is he living up to his obligation as president? And it is a big one. The job of the president is to figure out the next stage of good for a majority of people in the country and then develop a strategy to get there. And Trump, based on the public and top secret evidence is basically interested in his base, the people who support him, not the real majority of people in the country. And that, uh, in the end, may be also part of his downfall, if we have a downfall. Thank you. Uh, because of your book, uh, it is now well known that Trump believes real power is fear. Do you agree that fear really makes Trump so powerful? If so, what kind of fear Trump will use this time? The title, fear, comes from Trump. And uh, in 2016, when he was running for president, a young reporter at the Post named Bob Costa, who's one of the great young reporters there, Costa and I interviewed Trump and uh, at this time, President Obama, who was still in office, said, talked about real power. And he said, real power is not having to use violence. Obama didn't like violence. And so we asked Trump, well, what do you think? What's real power? And, he, and it was almost a Shakespearean moment in which... It's uh, Hamlet turning to the audience in an aside and saying, this is what's really going on. And Trump said, real power is fear. And of course, that's what we see. He scares the daylights out of people. Intentional, it's a technique. And up to a point, it works. Um, it may not continue to work. I mean, imagine, I, at the time, I, I had to check the transcript in the tape. I said, he really said, mm -hmm. really thought real power is fear? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I guess maybe that comes out of doing real estate deals in New York City, uh, where you can just, make a deal, agree to a deal, and then back off and scare people. And, and you know, that's, that's what he does. Yeah. Uh, it's regarding North Korea. Um, jokingly, I've told the Korean publisher, uh, publisher of your book, uh, that Kim Jong-un will uh, wrap up, literally, wrap up the book to know Trump better. Uh, how do you evaluate Trump as a negotiator? Is he really genius in, uh, in art of deal? Well, 
Well, that's that's a great question. Uh, if if you look at the history of Trump's dealing with North Korea while he's been president, initially Kim Jong Un uh, rather remarkably tweeted, or no, it was a speech he gave. He said, "We ha I have a nuclear button," and Trump responded by saying, "I have a nuclear button also, but mine is bigger than yours," and it really was getting quite tense. And then uh, the intelligence agencies in the United States made it very clear to President Trump that North Korea has more nuclear weapons than you think. They are deployed on eight axle mobile missile launchers provided by China. Uh, they are dispersed throughout North Korea, though it's pretty frightening. And so Trump uh, I believe this is one of the things he did that was wise. He reached out to Kim Jong-un and they began a series of negotiations. Uh, Trump thinks you can get North Korea to denuclearize, get rid of their nuclear weapons. All the intelligence agencies during the Obama presidency, during the Trump presidency have told the president, whoever he is, that there's no way North Korea is going to give up their nuclear mm -hmm. weapons because that's their leverage, that's their status in the world. Mm -hmm. So eventually Trump will accept North Korea as a nuclear state? Well, we'll, do, we'll have to, he says no. He said that, that we've they have to get rid of their nuclear weapons, but um, that's that's a long road, and uh, a lot of people think he won't get there. Uh, we're going to have to see. What what is interesting in the book? Uh, one of Trump's aides is asking him about North Korea. Kind of, how do you see it? We okay? Okay. Okay, um, and Trump says, I'm, I'm, I'm just a fascinating quote of the way he sees it as if Kim Jong-un and himself are gladiators in uh, the arena. And uh, that Trump says it's really leader versus leader, me, versus Kim, mm -hmm. the, you know, he sees it all in personal terms. And uh, as we know in diplomatic negotiations, the, the negotiators need to step back and kind of understand what the other side is looking for, what they want. And it's, it's not a kind of duel in the Colosseum where one person's going to triumph and one person's going to die. That's a, that is a dangerous way to see a negotiation. Yeah. Um, as I said before, uh, I'm a great admirer of your reporting uh, through nine presidencies. Concluding those reporting, what do you think is the essence of the great leadership of a president? What's the most important qualification in leading in this chaotic, polarizing, and hateful world? Uh, first, the president needs to understand the presidency. And it is a, an overwhelming concentration of power, as Trump uh, has displayed needs to understand the responsibility to all citizens and a responsibility to citizens of other countries. Uh, I just describe in the book how Trump almost started a war with North Korea in a very uh, frightening way. He was about to order here in South Korea where the U.S. has 28,500 troops, all the dependent spouses and children out, which traditionally is a suggestion war is going to come. He was going to tweet this out 
and uh, the vice chairman of the Politburo in North Korea, uh, who's very close to Kim Jong-un, sent a back-channel message to the White House December 4th, 2017, saying that if you take the dependence out of South Korea, we will take it as a signal that an attack is imminent. Mm -hmm. The military went nuts about this and talked him out of doing it, but this is the kind of mm -hmm. risk that he's taken with a national security uh, that frightens, frighten people inside and uh, should frighten everyone. It's you can have a catastrophic war by accident, not planned. And when you put nuclear weapons in the mix, it, it's, uh, it's too scary to contemplate. The World Knowledge Forum.